Bismillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. My dear brothers and my sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Here I am now at my computer looking at a piece of art. The price, 300 millions. When will you marry? By Paul Gauguin. And uh, 300 millions. Can you imagine someone is going to buy a piece of art for 300 millions when it's just a picture of two girls from Tahiti and uh, that's it. Uh, you go on the internet and just look for this. And the second one is $274 million, and it is the card players by Paul Cezanne. And again, this is 274 So we're talking about like phenomenal prices, and there are some people out there that are buying it, and pretty soon this art piece of art will reach in the billions. Now, a question here, what if I bought this piece of art, for example, the very first one, when will you marry? And then I took a small brush, okay, I've got the original, and then I take the brush and add a little bit on top of it. How much do you think the price of that art will become? Is it going to become expensive or is it going to turn it absolutely into a zero? Well, you got it right. That $300 million price will come to zero. Why? Because I have added something to it that is not original. Why did I choose this introduction? Because when we speak about innovations in Islam, people have different approach to them, so much so that today so many innovations are in our religion, and it is something, it seems like it's something okay, no big deal. Hey, what's the harm in having that? Is it kind of like going to cost the earth to have something there? Well, actually, it does cost the earth. Let's go back to the $300 million painting. So remember, if I took a piece of a brush and added a little bit to it, the price will plummet to zero. And nobody that want to buy it because it no longer is the original artwork. This is where the problem lies. Every time something that is not part of Islam gets added to Islam in the name of Islam hurts more than brings benefit. And this is in anything from your wudu to your fast to anything at all from reciting Al-Quran and anything in Al-Islam. And I'm saying this because we are approaching pretty soon Rabi' al-Awwal, the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. And as you have guessed it, a lot of people celebrate the birth of our Prophet wasallam. Today's topic is not about the birth itself. I will speak about it in the future. And I will even tell you when it started, specifically this celebration, who started it, why it was started, and how it got to us, and all that kind of stuff. But tonight I want to speak about innovations as a whole. And this is from the smallest innovation to the biggest innovation. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about al-Islam, he talks about it in a complete different way than what we are comprehending today. When the Sahaba speak about al-Islam, they speak about al-Islam fondly. They are willing to give their lives to defend this religion. It don't matter how much or how little out of it. But today, we have become extremely easy and lenient, and innovation to us is no longer an innovation. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, and that is the number five, which is one of the last that was revealed of Al-Quran. In the last year after Rasulullah did his pilgrimage, and on the way, after this surah was revealed to him, Rasulullah didn't live longer than 80 days. After that, he died, وسلم, and it is the last of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has descended upon mankind. In this surah, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unlike any other surah in Al-Quran, has called on us, the believers, 16 times. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala started this surah unlike any other surah. He started, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. This is exactly like Surah Al-Hujurat. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. And it is a set of commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us one after the other. Again, Surah Al-Ma'idah is, as I said, is the last of what has been revealed on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In it is an abundance, abundance, abundance of great things. And perhaps Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gives me a long life to study this surah. In this surah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala also mentions the very first crime of the killing. And remember, we do not believe that it is a Habila Qabil story that he killed him for a woman. 
that is a lie and it's been going on forever. But that is not the talk that I'm talking about. It is more about ayah number three. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْيَوْمَ يَئِسَ الَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا مِنْ دِينِكُمْ فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنِي In the translation of the nearest meaning is that today, this is after 22 years of continuous struggle in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells to the Muslims and to us. He tells us that الْيَئِسَ is completely lose hope. Those who have disbelieved have completely lost hope from your deen. i.e. to conquer, to get rid of Islam, to fake it, to do whatever it is to do, they have lost all hopes. فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنِي So do not be, if, uh, here, al-khashya is when you are afraid of somebody with respect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, then you fear me with respect and respect me and veneer me and not them. And then he said something which is actually why every innovation is haram in Islam. He says, اليوم Today, that is the day when he revealed this surah, this uh, surah al-Ma'idah. And for your information, after Allah revealed this ayah, there was not a single ayah that came with a, a halal or haram. After this ayah, the, ha the doors of halal and haram were closed, nothing at all. He says, اليوم, today, أكملت لكم دينكم. Akmala is when you have perfected, you have completely finished. That's it. It's totally done and everything is fine. Lakum for you, dinakum, i.e. today I have perfected to perfection the set of rules for you. And I have completely completed my ni'mah, my gift of Islam upon you. And I am pleased that Islam for you is the set of rules. So there you go. This is the last uh, ayat from the Quran Al-Kareem. So what this means is, every time you innovate in Al-Islam, you have added something to Al-Islam that is not part of it, but you made it part of it. And with that action, you're making a statement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not speak the truth. Because Allah says, I have perfected the religion for you, And you saying, no, 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 something is missing. I am going to add this, and this is the correct way. I'll give an example. You hear a lot when you are in a masjid going to pray that the imam says, for example, Sallu salatam wadda'. Pray the last prayer as if this is your last prayer. That is a bid'ah, that is an innovation. Because Rasulullah SAW didn't do it. Now, the sahaba didn't do it. The great scholars of Islam didn't do it. Now, when someone does it, he certainly doesn't know even. But in the sight of Allah, it is a bid'ah. And what happens when it is a bid'ah? The one who says it will get a sin for it, even if he said it with a good intention. Because the intention alone is not enough. The intention alone is not enough. You need the correct action. Allah knows what's in my heart. Allah told you what also to do by following the book and the sunnah. So, for example, that is one. Another bid'ah, for example, is to on the Jumu'ah day, people say Jumu'ah Mubarakan, Happy Jumu'ah, Blessed Jumu'ah, all these things. It is an innovation. Now, someone might come and say, why this is Jumu'ah, it's Eid, and on Eid we say, look, me and you, our job, as Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا In Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have the best example. Did Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say it? Okay, no, he didn't. Because if they say they, he did, we say, bring the hadith, bring something, bring some evidence. If the Prophet ﷺ didn't do it, then we must not do it. Because every time you do an innovation, a bid'ah, you can rest assured you have killed a sunnah. Or for example, someone might come to you and says, you cannot allow, you are not allowed to speak while eating. And you go, why? Uh, because now, is this a hadith? Bring it over. If it's not hadith, then you have sinned because you have innovated. So as you can tell, innovation in Islam are extremely dangerous. There are over thousands of uh, bid'ah that a lot of Muslims do on a daily basis. From saying more than astaghfirullah three times after the salat. A lot of people after the salat, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. They say it like astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, six, seven times. The three first ones are the sunnah. You see, the problem, my dear brothers and my sisters, with the innovations is this. When we do an innovation, even in one word we say, what happens is Allah does not accept the action and you get the sin for it. 
So as you can tell here, it really is extremely dangerous to invent things and push them in the account of Islam. And as I said, we are coming close to the birth of Rasulullah But let me tell you something here about the birth of this great man. The Arabs before, why did it was not a big issue to note down the birth of somebody is because at that time there, A, they didn't have a national office where you go and register the newborn baby. A newborn baby, and that's end of it. The, most of them didn't even know how old they were. And also when the baby is born, they didn't know if this guy here is going to have a happy life or is he going to become someone important or not. So when the baby is born, there is nothing really about them. It's just he's born. So when Rasulullah was born, he actually, nobody knew that this man was going to be a prophet. So he was born and nobody paid attention to his birth. Even the scholars, when they wanted to debate when he was born, there are more than 10 sayings with different dates, with different dates. It's not even on the 12th of Rabia al-Awwal. Nobody ever has any reference onto that. And number three or four or five, whatever it is, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had celebrated his birthday, then we certainly would have. He had lived 22 years and a few months after he became a prophet, we could have known that he was every, uh, let's say, the next year on a Monday. But what we know is, as in Sahih Muslim, that Rasulullah was born on a Monday. He was born on a Monday. And even when he was dead, there is a difference between the scholars because, again, people were not extremely good with calculating. For your own information, the calculation of the Muslim calendar, what we call the Hijri calendar, started in the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anha. At least, at least, at least that's three years after the death of Rasulullah When you look in the books of the Sirah and everything, hardly ever there is an issue in Islam where the scholars have, have more than a saying in it. And that's because the documentation at that time and keeping the days and everything was nil. It didn't exist at all, at all, at all, at all. So Rasulullah would travel, he would come back. The Sahaba didn't pay much attention to these uh, kind of things. That brings us to today. Let me tell you something, my dear brothers and my sisters. Again, I will speak more about this in the coming uh, talks, inshallah. But at this moment here, if someone wants to celebrate the birth of Rasulullah we have to ask them a question. Are you doing this as an act of worship or not? If they say as an act of worship, we tell them where is the evidence. And the evidence must be Allah says or the Prophet Sallallahu said. We do not accept any other saying of a scholar or anybody. Even if uh, the whole story is mentioned by one billion scholars, I still want to know where they got it from. What makes their statement true? If the person says, oh, no, 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 I'm not doing it uh, as an act of worship. The next question comes in, are you expecting rewards for it? And obviously people, yes, they are expecting rewards out of it. If they say yes, and we still have to ask the question, what makes you believe that you're going to get any reward for it? Do you have any tax for that? And they won't be able to provide that. And the dumbest answer would be, I'm actually not doing it as an act of worship, and I am not expecting any rewards for it. Then the question would be, why are you doing it? Have you become just like Christians now? Are we going to market our things? Are we going to make money? Let's celebrate so that we can make money. And that's another danger. Is when Muslims start celebrating the birth of Rasulullah to make money. And it becomes just like Christianity. And believe me, it does exist in Muslim world. North African countries, parts of Africa, things like that. Yes, and Palestine and even in Saudi Arabia. A lot of people do celebrate these bidas. So as you can tell, my dear brothers and my sisters, this Islam is complete. If Al-Islam was a building then the gates of this religion have been locked and locked with keys and the keys went with Rasulullah when he died they were raised into the heavens there is not a thing that needs to be added to this religion it's complete it's perfect we do not celebrate Rasulullah's birthday nor his death. We're not going to say happy birthday because what we are doing actually is we headed towards becoming just Christians. It's except they have the 25th of December and us we have the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal and some countries they put uh, lights and they did all that kind of stuff. 
But I'm telling you, it's widely spread worldwide. Save yourself from this headache. Do not celebrate. Your children, because they go to school either to Muslim, I mean, or to the non-Muslims, and I strongly, strongly advise you to put them in a Muslim school or guarantee their home education or whatever. But in any case, if the children go to non-Muslim school, the British government knows that the celebration of uh, the Mulad is bid'ah. But they will encourage them. It's Muhammad's prophet. Let's celebrate it so that your child, when comes the time to celebrate the 25th of December, your child, you cannot say to your child because John and Paul and uh, Ringo and uh, uh, George uh, celebrated with him the the birth of the prophet Muhammad why shouldn't Muhammad celebrate the birth of Jesus with John Paul and George why and your child will be so confused mom why do they like our us and they celebrate with us and why are we like that and we are not uh, really friendly why don't we celebrate and then you get uh, in the big trouble Again, as we will grow, I will speak, inshallah, tabarakah wa ta'ala, about some innovations that have been added to the birth of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Gradually, we build up so that you are well educated and you are part of this great group here, so you know innovations are not us. And anyone who says something, you need evidences. So, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all. And until tomorrow in a new subject about the birth of this great man, you guys be in the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And promote this group to others. Make other people come. Let them seek the right knowledge as you are. You will get great results for pointing them to this group. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam Ibn Ammar. And to join this group here, just send me a message with your name to 078 And you can send me an email at islampeptalk at gmail.com. Stay in the realm of the kitab, the book of Allah, and the sin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and all will be verified. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put a lot of barakah in your lives. And until tomorrow, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.